So hello and welcome to session one of the New Testament Chrome blog journey. My name's Hilary McNutt and I, I kind of love to study the Bible and to teach it. I am a wisdom understanding seeker. If I don't understand something, it kind of grates on me. The problem solver is alive and well. I'm also the only employee of Mustard Seed Thinking. I started it to kind of consolidate some of my previous studies and to give me deadlines and keep me accountable for future studies. And it worked because I now have two books which I've made into online courses and a load of blogs and vlogs called A Lighter Look at Seriously Important Subjects. And last year I worked my way through the Old Testament and shared what stood out to me in a weekly vlog. If you want to check on my beliefs, find out what else I get up to for the Christians, you'll find that in mustardseedthinking.com and I've popped a link in the description below. When I came to study the New Testament, I felt to kind of take a different approach to this. Rather than try and fit it into a nice, neat reading plan, a kind of neat timeline, I felt to let the book dictate how long it's going to take us. A set time made a lot of sense when we were doing the Old Testament because it's huge and we could just drown in it. But um, I have to say studying it chronologically was a huge eye-opener. Previously obscure passages just started to make a lot more sense. When I thought about the New Testament, I want to be able to linger. I want to explore and kind of read around the elements and the cross references and the concepts, just as I feel led to really. And if it takes years, I'm going to be okay with that. And that is just as well because life turned a little bit upside down this year and I am much later than I planned getting started. But at least there still is a plan. That plan is to start by looking at the Gospels side by side and, of course, in chronological order of events. I'm comparing different charts when considering the order to put it in, recognising there are, of course, differences of opinion. I'm going to read first in the New American Standard Bible, partly because a studious friend recommended it and partly because it's good to read different version to what you normally default to. It's also good to read more than one translation and for this I'm going to choose The Bible for Everyone by Tom Wright for something fresh and The New Living Translation because it's a popular one. To pull out the meanings I'll use the NRSV Strong's Concordance Bible. Now each session consists of the passage of scripture that we're working at and any other relevant verses that cropped up as I studied and have you seen a squirrel, Teddy? Yeah. Um, about 10 minutes or so of this kind of video and some key thinking time. You know, I am not here to try and dictate what you should believe. My heart is to stir us up to think and discuss and to learn how to communicate with God for ourselves so that we can take those questions to him. So before we go forward, it's a good idea to have a look back. I'm going through a kind of summary of the Old Testament, um, the narrative of it really. And Nehemiah chapter 9 does such a great job of this that I don't need to try and replicate it. But it's quite a long read, so I'm going to split it over a couple of sessions. We're mulling on these verses. So I'm going to put the reading in one translation and then I'm often going to go through it in a different translation in the video time as well. So we're starting in verse 9 and I am in the New American Standard Bible. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens and all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, you give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. You are the Lord God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you, and made a covenant with him, to give him the land of Canaanite, of the Hittite, the Amorite, of the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite, 
to give it to his descendants, and you have fulfilled your promise, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and heard their cry by the Red Sea. Then you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly towards them, and made a name for yourself, as it is this day. You divided the sea before them, so they passed through the midst of the sea on dry ground, and their pursuers you hurled into the depth, like a stone into raging waters. And with a pillar of cloud you led them by day, and with a pillar of fire by night, to light for them the way in which they were to go. Then you came down from Mount Sinai, and spoke with them from heaven, and you gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. So you made known to them your holy Sabbath, and laid down for them commandments, statutes and law through your servant Moses. You provided bread from heaven for them in their hunger, and you brought forth water from a rock for them for their thirst. And you told them to enter in order to possess the land which you swore to give them. But they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and wouldn't listen to your commandments. They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. So as well as taking the time to look back at that summary, I've been thinking about what I specifically want to bring from the Old Testament into exploring the New. As I went through the Old Testament, I noted several key themes. Arguably, the strongest was the fear of the Lord. Deuteronomy 13, 4 is a good example. Serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Obey his commands, listen to his voice and cling to him. It was something that they had to learn to do. Come, my children, and listen to me and I will teach you to fear the Lord, David said. It's that attitude of reverence, awe, of wonder, a unique love that holds him higher than anything and anyone else, and a certain obedience because of who we believe he is. It's the attitude system that kept them on track, not going off it, which of course is one definition of sin. Remembering also popped up again and again as a tool to help them to come back on track. And each time they did that, either personally or together, the result was recommitment and reconnection. Like later on in our passage, the people responded, in view of all this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. Now, another tool given to them was called Sabbath, and it correlated to that day of rest that God took after creation. He named it holy and he sanctified it. And it's a day of rest and play. That's the opposite of work. And it was really, I think, made for a time that people could remember get themselves right with God, that reconnecting, recommitting that's so important. So we're going to see these main themes were connected and influenced each other. And I'm bringing them in to the New Testament as we go. I'm expecting to see them as we go through the records. So in the next session, we'll continue remembering the story with Nehemiah chapter 9. And I'm going to see you then.